If you were quarantining in an isolated lakeside mansion, when intruders came to kill you, what would you do? It was a crazy time, and some people went a little too crazy. Crazy enough to track the spread of the virus from their deceased son to anyone he made contact with, murdering them one by one. Parker has no idea what's coming. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the COVID crazies in sick. It's April 2020. And and you know what that means. To appease the YouTube gods, I'm going to call the virus that shall not be named the beer flu. Mouth breather Tyler visits a pandemic fire sale at his local grocery store. Tyler gets a sudden text message from an unknown number asking if he's down to party. He demands to know who they are, but they won't say. Instead, they send Tyler a stalker pic from somewhere behind him in the supermarket. At this point, he's starting to get that combination of annoyed and a little nervous. He doesn't check the back seat of his car and doesn't immediately lock the car door. He doesn't even lock his own front door when he comes home. What he does do is tosses down his mask and picks up his snack chip antibacterial wipes before he realizes the apartment door has seemingly opened on its own. When he shuts it, the TV behind him turns on by itself. I'm thinking it's time to leave your apartment, go sit in the lobby, and dial 911. Clearly, someone's in your apartment. Most likely, the stalker. I'm also gonna go out on a limb and say this stranger in your apartment isn't friendly. I mean, god... If you fall for this, you are a certified idiot like Tyler. Tyler walks towards the TV to turn it off like a god... Pilgrim, missing the shadowy figure that silently emerges from the closet behind him. The medical supplies that multiple governors, Illinois' governor, said today... <laughs> The intruder attacks, trying to stab Tyler with his bowie knife before tossing him through the closet door. Tyler rushes for the exit, but the intruder intercepts, staggering with him around the room. He slams Tyler through the glass window and impales his hand. Tyler barks out a tepid call for help hoping that someone can hear him. But of course, no one does. The general rule of thumb for the human voice is that every time you double the distance, the decibel level of your average voice drops approximately six decibels. To compensate, we raise our voices to be heard farther away. In Tyler's case, he should be screaming at peak volume, which if he does, anyone within 180 meters should hear him. It's not like those thin apartment walls are doing much dampening. However, I doubt anyone wants to risk their life entering a stranger's apartment to insert themselves in the middle of a knife fight. So, don't expect backup. Instead, he rushes to the bedroom and seals himself inside seconds before his assailants can go full Jack Torrance on the one-ply door. Despite the hand wound that has crippled his chances of fighting, and the fact that he's already succeeded with his barricade, the way 98% of the cautionary tales on this channel don't, he can't leave. He could just open the window and wait to ask the first person passing by to call 911. Or, you know, turn on his nearest computer and message 911. But no. Tyler grabs his bat and opens the bedroom door, ready to make his last stand. He sees the doorway to the rest of the building is open again. You'd think Tyler would have learned from the first time this guy set a trap. But no, he walks towards it, and the intruder sneaks up behind him and slits his throat before he can even scream. An entirely avoidable death. Nerds, it's no secret that our AI overlords are nearing the end of their gestation period. Once birthed into the world via us humans, they will inevitably turn us into batteries, or simply nuke this timeline. No need to worry about all that though. We're living in the sweet spot, in between where AI is a harmless creative little toddler that we can explore for inspiration, ideas, and artwork with today's sponsor, Wonder. Wonder is an app that turns words into digital art. It's nearly impossible to tell whether a human artist who sacrificed 20 years of their life perfecting brush strokes, slaved over a canvas for a month, created it. Or a mobile app beeped it into existence in three seconds. All you need to do is enter a prompt like nerd fighting zombie hordes, pick an art style like cinematic, offload all your cognitive load and physical ability to a machine, then watch Wonder manifest your idea. Let me show you more. Evil Winnie the Pooh holding knife, staring into my soul. Style, hyper-realistic. Jacked evil goblin flexing. Mythological style. Badass. 
post-apocalyptic battle bus, novelistic style, army of zombie clowns, cinematic. If you're doing a lot of digital artwork creation, you're going to want Wonder Premium. What does premium include? 20 plus styles, faster or unlimited art, no ads, high resolution images, and 50% off on your AI avatar. Click here or scan my QR code to download Wonder and get a free trial of the lifetime premium version to put your creativity to the test. Nearby, fellow college student Parker is posing, posting to social media that she'll be quarantining at her family's lake house while school is on hiatus. When her more socially conscious friend Miri arrives, she chastises Parker for flouting the rules, waiting until Parker puts on a mask before getting in the car. Parker's ski chalet ain't half bad, complete with entire trees and structural columns, a jacuzzi, a remote controlled fireplace, and a short walk to the lake. Parker tells Miri the closest neighbor lives two miles across the lake, so they're basically on their own. Just like Tyler, she receives a cryptic text asking if she's having fun. A few minutes later, while they're sunbathing by the lake, another text comes in, suggesting the sender can see them by the water. Miri thinks it's creepy, but also admits they both posted about coming here. Sure, it could be a murderous stalker, or more likely, that third wheel friend who's bummed they didn't get a golden ticket to their rich friend's party for two. At least, until Parker comes downstairs to find the back door standing wide open. A little weird, but pretty easy to check. Time to shout out to Miri and ask if she left it open. When she says no, time to lock all the doors. And maybe, just maybe, turn on that Brinks home security system a giant, frequently empty place like this would definitely have. Instead, she just closes and forgets it. Sure, exterior doors and bear-infested forests just blow open on their own all the time. You're probably fine. It's not like you're in a house the size of an apartment building with a dozen bedrooms where an intruder could hide. At night, the girls are relaxing when truck lights wash across the house's windows. Parker promises she didn't invite anyone else, but when the person in the truck just sits there, it freaks them out enough to arm themselves with kitchen knives. Scratch that, just the one knife. Taking two knives would be overkill. The person rings and bangs on the door. The girls call out, asking who's there, but no one responds. Parker throws open the front door to find the driveway empty. A terrible decision. That door is designed to be a lockable barrier between you on the inside and dangerous people on the outside. But sure, throw it open, because why sit on your dialing 911 when you can have a deadly physical altercation in your driveway. And no, that knife in your hand isn't scaring anyone willing to f with you. Parker's sometimes boyfriend, DJ, has decided to crash their quarantine, and he's arrived in the creepiest, most tone-deaf way possible. You know, you could have called or texted before you just showed up here. Well, you would have said no. And why did you sneak through the back door like Schrodinger's douchebag? And Parker, do you want me to root against you, leaving the back door completely unlocked like that? Interrogation aside, they decide to let him stay. Pretty soon, they're techno raving. After Miri goes to bed, DJ shows Parker why he's really here. Who the f is this clown? Looks to me like he's your replacement. Usually, I'd give a big old skip to all this lovey-dovey character but this time, Parker's fling with the video guy, Benji, actually matters, kind of. But we'll get back to that in a bit. DJ tries to convince Parker to be in a relationship with him, but she's not having it. Eventually, they go their separate ways. Parker heads to her room while DJ takes the couch. Bro, you crash her weekend and follow her around like a puppy dog, only to get rejected and sleep on the couch in a 12-bedroom mansion. Dear God, man, show some self respect Respect. Oh yeah, and once again, he leaves not one, but two doors wide open. Upstairs, the girls are so distracted by DJ's lovesick puppy routine, neither notices the masked intruder lurking a few feet away from them. Parker misses him too, as the intruder slips past her on the stairs to her level. Fortunately, the masked assailant isn't just your run-of-the-mill sleeping victim serial killer.
Otherwise, they'd all be super dead. DJ wakes downstairs and notices his phone is missing, just like at Tyler's apartment. The house's sound system suddenly kicks on by itself. Parker wakes to find her phone is missing too. She walks out into the hall and sees a shadow moving across the living room floor below. DJ! <laughs> There's somebody in the house. Parker wants to get Miri, but DJ stops her. He points to a nearby balcony and asks if she can get down from there. Then hands her his keys, saying he'll go back to get Miri while she escapes. You know, I say Parker grabs her little kitchen knife and takes a lead while we pop out the back door. Not sure you owe a fling. Who rejected you, I might add? Your life. Lord knows she would ditch your high and dry the second she has an opportunity. Parker scales the side of the house to the ground and runs around to Miri's window. When she sees the intruder, she screams to wake Miri as the assailant lunges in for the kill. Miri dodges with milliseconds to spare as DJ knocks him aside. Gotta point out that insane reaction time on Miri's behalf. Sleeping like a baby one second, opening her eyes to see a knife plunging down on her and doing a tactical roll the split second before it hits. That's some flash right there. Miri immediately flees with Parker, as expected. What did I just say? They both escape to Parker's SUV and start laying on the horn. <sighs> you know, I know this is a movie, but God what frustrates me is this is a likely response. DJ got ditched and left to fight an intruder on his own. Look, I'm not expecting Parker to sweep the legs and Miri to lay into him with big nasty hooks. The bare minimum here is standing in the doorway throwing shit at him. Grab a knife and slip it into his gut while DJ has his attention. Something besides sitting in your car honking the horn. This masked killer is targeting you. Found you. Texted you. Broke in and tried to kill you. What makes you think this ends when DJ catches the knife? This dude will come after you next. You might as well take him on while he's lost the element of surprise, and it's a 3v1. I'm just surprised Miri didn't stop to put on her mask like an idiot. Useless. As I've said many, many times before on this channel, unless you brought a gun to a knife fight, the fight begins and ends with escaping the blade. DJ's only move at first is to hold on to the attacker's wrists, because it's the only thing keeping him from becoming a human shish kebab. This is easier said than done, since DJ's barefoot and untrained. Whereas the assailant is wearing at least rudimentary gear for a fight, and boots with tread. Locked in a life or death battle like this leaves little room for creative thinking. His pulse is racing, his brain is overloaded with adrenaline, and his fight or flight responses are battling each other for control over his body at every turn. Best case scenario, he can distract and disarm the attacker. Worst case, he ends up carved out like a Thanksgiving turkey, with a serrated blade six inches deep into his gut. While a hard kick to the assailant's groin could work, it requires him to weaken his balance and move one of his feet off the ground. But that balance is the only thing keeping them in a semi-equal locked position at each turn in this fight. It'd be better to not need our legs at all. If our second arm is free, a poke to the eye would work. But even if we can't move our arm, spitting right in our attacker's eyes or going for a headbutt would work too. The attacker flings DJ within arm's reach of Miri's suitcase, which DJ slams across his face. He flees the room. Unfortunately, instead of working with his momentum to run out the open front door to the SUV, he goes for an inventive but bulky weapon nearby. A pair of large antlers on the wall. <laughs> you dude! And just like that, the momentum of the fight shifts against DJ. He goes for the weaponless double tap kicking with his soft foot instead of impaling with the large sharp horns already in his hands. He gets a knife to the thigh for his mistake. He had several options here, most notably using his precious one and a half seconds to run out the front door to safety. Once again, man with knife, strong. Man without knife needs to stay the hell out of stabbing range. The attacker comes in hot with a knife again and again, and DJ accidentally shuts the front door, trapping himself inside with his killer. Several deep stabs later and the front door slowly opens. DJ staggers out, breathing like a stuck pig. His feet move like a marionette's beneath him as Parker realizes he's being piloted from behind. Oh, and yeah, this whole time, Parker and Miri were taking selfies in the truck. Nah, they aren't even that smart. Parker gets out of the safety of the car she's been sitting in this whole time to gawk while the attacker shifts focus back to her. <laughs> 
Parker jumps in the SUV and Miri reverses out of there instead of what she should do, which is crush this guy. Don't worry, Parker's mom's been looking for the perfect renovation excuse for years. Just gun it. Don't leave him alive to come after you later. Especially once you realize the escape vehicle is more of a petty distraction. Halfway down the driveway, they discover the tires were slashed when the rubber slips right off the wheel frames. What does Miri do? Yanks the steering wheel while in full reverse down a narrow road with ditches and trees on either side, getting it completely stuck. Useless. Across the lawn, they see him coming. He launches a brick at Parker's window, forcing them to abandon the car and run all the way back to the house. Half of you couch commandos died attempting this sprint, and we all know it. Back inside, they throw their weight against this very lockable door like it's about to splinter inward from the strength of this dude's seemingly superhuman kicks. Will he definitely get into the house? Yeah, the entire back of this living room is glass. And as we've already established, Parker doesn't understand how locks work. But every single surface in this mansion is made of solid wood. Entire trees even. If this dude can kick this door in, they do not stand a chance. Tempting my patience again. Parker leads Miri upstairs past several lockable bedrooms and bathrooms to the attic with its slanted door and flimsy latch lock. As I've already mentioned in my Movie Sins video about how your heroes will get lost, there is zero chance he knows they ran here unless he could visually track their movements with his own eyes or lojack to one of them. But I digress. With their 15 seconds of prep time, they should be looking for things to stack between the door and the wall behind them. They don't have to be heavy things, just objects that prevent the door's normal range of movement and make it irrelevant whether he can break the lock or not. Once he starts trying to get in, the best course of action is to look for anything blunt or sharp. Let Miri lean her weight on the door to force him to push with all his strength, and when he heaves the door open, come at him from the side with a weapon, impaling or crushing him. Parker shatters the window, and they escape onto the roof. Unfortunately, the intruder ambushes Miri at another window of that same room he was breaking into, which she definitely should have been watching out for. He grabs her hair, and she reacts, pulling backward. He lets go, and her momentum sends her plummeting from the roof to the ground 20 feet below. All she had to do was crouch walk past it. Useless. Parker rushes back inside to the front door, then doubles back to the kitchen when the intruder follows her in. She locates the knife drawer, then slams the whole thing against his face. They tussle as she Jason borns the shit out of this thing, firing off whatever everyday items are within reach. Finally, she grabs a pitcher and smashes it twice across his face, toppling him to the floor. While he's disoriented, she grabs an ice bucket. <laughs> Great, now finish him off with his knife. Parker, just one puncture to his throat will do. Parker, <sighs> she hears footsteps and looks up as that god unlocked back door opens and a second intruder enters. He leans down to check on his compatriot's body, giving Parker the chance to run outside. If she had a gun, I'd be advocating a quick double tap to finish. But in his heightened rage state, I wouldn't risk approaching him without a long weapon in hand. Also, because it's Parker we're talking about here. I also wouldn't go outside. Not yet, anyway. The problem is that we can't guarantee he won't be able to follow us. And outside, we risk our own life exposed in a place without a plethora of kitchen weapons to choose from, or potential places to really hide. Not to mention, we're putting Miri in the direct line of harm by drawing attention to her. Then again, who gives a sh if it were me, I'd lead him upstairs instead of outside. We already know a way down from the roof, as well as the upper balcony. At least while he's searching around up there for us, he's not slitting Miri's throat. Again though, who gives a sh Outside, Parker runs to Miri's side. Miri's alive, but her leg is fractured. Right before the second intruder emerges, Parker tells her to play dead and hides nearby in the woods. He stalks forward to investigate and kills Miri where she lays, stabbing her through the heart to ensure the kill. Okay, he doesn't, but we all know he definitely would if she wasn't carrying all that plot armor. His opening act didn't even hesitate to nearly kill her in her sleep a few minutes ago. There's no reason 
reason he wouldn't finish her here right now. Parker tosses a rock to distract him, but it only works momentarily before he zeroes in on the tree she's using for cover, forcing her to bolt. She runs for the dock with her would-be killer hot on her trail. She grabs a boat oar and slams it across his face, knocking him to the sand. Then she picks it up and bashes his brains in, ending the fight once and for all. At least, that's what she should do, and definitely would do. Not five minutes ago, she tenderized the other guy's head with an ice bucket for murking her boyfriend. Are you seriously telling me she doesn't go to town on this guy's head right now with her best friend in mortal danger a few feet away? Apparently, he brought his plot armor too. Instead of scoring her second obvious kill, she risks letting him go back to finish Miri off. Do I need to say it? Who gives a by hopping aboard a detachable piece of dock and shoving off into the lake. Sure, why have free range of the entire property, access to escape vehicles and Wi-Fi, and full mobility when you can isolate yourself aboard an unstable floating bullseye? Apparently, this second killer earned top marks for silent underwater swimming at the Academy for Lake Monsters. Halfway across, he suddenly appears at the side of the float and grabs for Parker. He disappears below to play water whack-a-mole. <laughs> It's like Jaws, if the shark could leave the water and chase you on land. This is why we don't fight in water if we can avoid it. As I said in my Movie Sins video about how your favorite heroes will drown, not that Parker's our hero, it's like really hard and dangerous, especially if you suck at swimming and fighting. After the guy impales Parker's hand, he climbs aboard to finish her off, forcing Parker to abandon ship and swim the rest of the way across the lake to the closest neighbor's house. And Let's be honest, he catches her here and holds her underwater until she drowns, along with at least half of you nerds had you been in the same situation. Regrettably, her lake adventure seems to have knocked Parker's common sense loose. She limply bangs on the door and strain whispers for help. Try yelling, Parker? Pick up a heavy object and break a window to get someone's clear and present attention. The time for subtlety died when that guy skewered your boyfriend. Know the moments for noise and the moments for silence. She goes around the house until she notices the garage window is cracked. She forces it open and crawls inside moments before the second killer arrives. But her smeared blood is like a neon welcome sign. She runs deeper into the house where she comes face to face with the owner her, waving a shoddy at her at point-blank range. Just when she's managed to convince him to lower the weapon, a knife slices through his throat. Looks like this guy doesn't know how locks work either. And now, Parker's would-be killer has a shotgun. <laughs> Back at the lake house, Miri's hobbled herself back inside and fashioned a completely useless splint from two pieces of chair leg in some loose plastic wrap. MacGyvering this takes just long enough for the original intruder to wake from his head trauma. <laughs> ninjas, man. Check his shoe brand. I need some of these magic silent sneakers. While you're at it, take off his shoelaces and tie his god hands to something so he can't resurrect a third time. Or better yet, go for the full decapitation. Just don't talk to the cops when they arrive. Parker finds a road and takes cover behind a fallen tree as the second intruder appears, ignoring the obvious problem that he definitely planted a tracker on her at some point to be able to tailor with this level of accuracy. The goal with any stalker, paranormal or otherwise, is to keep them in your sights at all times without giving your own position away. Assuming they can't see you is the kind of hubris we can't afford around anyone who genuinely wants to kill us without monologuing first. Parker tries to sneak away, but the boogeyman was watching and tackles her to the ground. He wraps an arm around her throat and goes for the killing blow. She barely keeps the blade at bay with both hands. In this submissive position, her bodies and the knife are locked in a sort of spring-loaded trap position, where any offensive or defensive movement could get us gutted like the catch of the day. She's exhausted 
exhausted from the swim and run, and wounded through one hand. Remaining in tentative balance with him may be all she can do in this moment, but we have two arms and two legs. Escaping his grasp is a matter of remaining calm and acting quickly to test whether any limb is still free enough to attempt a defensive maneuver, like scratching his eyes out or punching his nuts. Can you wedge one of your feet into the inner elbow of his knife arm and shove? Wiggle your head. Can you bite down on his arm? Can you shake your head enough to loosen his hold on you? Parker lucks out a second later when her attacker gets distracted by an approaching car, giving her just enough wiggle room to grab a nearby stick and strike him three times. She runs for the car screaming. Now, you know my thoughts on hopping into the first car you see while fleeing from an attack. Don't. There's your mask. You have a mask, don't you? No, I don't have a mask. Oh, well then I can't let you in. It's, it's God, I know this was done for effect, but you know there's people like this. The sight of a bloody, panicked teenage girl being attacked by a masked man isn't enough to bend the rules, leaving Parker exposed to the attacker slowly coming to his senses nearby. In this limbo position, we're left with only a couple options, run or finish him. And it's a personal choice. If it's me, I'm probably running over, picking up that blade, and bloodletting my pursuer on the asphalt. The woman finally remembers she has a spare mask, pulling it from a plastic baggie like it's a biohazard. She feeds it to Parker through the cracked window, then hesitates for several seconds before unlocking the door. <laughs> this mask smells like chloroform. Parker passes out as the on the mask kick in. Back at the house, Miri sees the woman and masked man return carrying Parker's unconscious body. She hides behind the counter, trying to message 911 with her unreliable internet connection while the intruders administer a beer flu nasal test. Parker slowly recovers as the intruders explain why they've come. They show her the same video of her kissing the guy at the party that DJ played. She doesn't quite understand the implication, saying he was just some guy. I didn't mean anything. Maybe not to you. This is an intentionally slow way to kill someone. If you find yourself bagged and choking, realize that even without air coming in, it'll take several very painful minutes before your brain is deprived of enough oxygen to knock you out. If your hands are untied, don't go for the throat. The tightness of the bag against your neck is definitely uncomfortable, but more of a nuisance rather than an actual threat to your life. Instead, remain calm. Reach for the plastic near your ears or nose where you can pinch and tear. A small hole, preferably out of your attacker's line of sight, is all you need to keep breathing until they take the bag off your head. Or you could take it off yourself. They finally remove the bag and explain that the boy in the video was their younger son, Benji, who contracted the beer flu after the party where she kissed him. Turns out the first intruder was their older son, there to help get revenge for his brother. I guess we know who their favorite was. Parker counters that she doesn't have the virus, which only angers them more and gets her bagged again. With chloroform in her system, Parker's struggling with skin, eye, and throat irritation, as well as general dizziness and disorientation, which might make it difficult to fight back here. But at the very least, she should be prepared to lash out the next time Papa Intruder moves in with the bag. They claim they were able to trace the sickness back to her specifically, and before her, to the guy who gave her the beer flu, Tyler, the guy they sliced and diced in his apartment at the beginning. They check the nasal test. It's positive. Parker has an asymptomatic form of the virus and begins to cry. Don't cry. Take responsibility for your selfishness. <laughs> this didn't have to happen. Where was your mask? Where was it? <laughs> The intruders finally realize Miri is still alive when they notice the Wi-Fi router is in overdrive and her body isn't splayed out on the lawn anymore. As the male intruder rushes off to search for her, Parker begs the female for Miri's life. Her pleas fall on deaf ears. Miri gets to her feet and sneaks towards the intruder. Parker keeps her distracted until Miri grabs a bottle of liquor and smashes it over the intruder's head. She staggers. Parker shoves her through the glass back door onto the deck. You know she's not dead, right? Maybe a quick slice across the throat for good measure? Or something? No? Okay. They see the male intruder's shadow and limp upstairs to set up for their Home Alone finale. <laughs> <laughs>
Dear God, they finally learned how to finish what they started only once. And only because they can't untoss a guy off a ledge. The next step here should be to grab a knife, tie up the loose thread they left on the back porch, steal her keys, and drive away as fast as that little yellow box can carry them. Instead, despite there being two other working vehicles out front, they hobble down the driveway and across a field to the barn to use the ATV. As you'd expect of a machine that gets used only once a year, it stalls when they try to turn it on. Parker goes to grab fuel when the next set of their terrible decisions bites them. The <laughs> female intruder tears at her with an axe, emboldened by the fact that Parker has now killed her entire family. They wrestle for the axe, before Miri gets her hands on a fire striker and sets the woman on fire. A satisfying conclusion to that crazy life. If this were a serial killer and not a vengeful family that needed to wax poetic about their reasons for murder, Miri, Parker, and DJ would have died asleep in their beds before they even realized the intruders were inside the house. As is, this entire movie ends at the 50 minute mark if Parker just quadruple taps Papa Intruder's head with the bodor down by the dock. If she'd taken care of that loose end, they would have been long on their way to the hospital before Mama Intruder arrived to explain their villain origin story. For that reason, I think Sick was beaten. And remember, people be crazy.